uh, participating in the service virtually over our live stream this morning. It is good to see all of you today. Uh, it is, as Angel reminded us, and as the decorations indicate, the first Sunday in Advent. And for this, su this Advent season, we'll be spending these four weeks of Advent with the prophet Zephaniah. Uh, prob probably the first Advent series many of us will have heard on, from the prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah is sort of like the crazy uncle of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, we don't really want to get near this guy very, very much, but he has a word for us. And um, Advent is really supposed to be about a, a, a time set aside for us to prepare ourselves for the coming of Jesus. As we look toward Christmas morning, the, the, the reality of Jesus' first coming, it's also an occasion for us to remember that we now still live in a time when we are waiting in reality for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's really what Advent is about, and so that's a big reason why I chose Zephaniah for us uh, this Advent season. But I also think he has a word to speak specifically in our current context in the world. Um, and so the reading is thankfully in the bulletin. You don't need to rifle through your Bible and try to find Zephaniah. It's on, it's on the bottom of page 5 in the, in the bulletin. Um, and it goes on to page 6 as well. So hear then the word of our God from Zephaniah chapter 1. You know, why don't you, why don't you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? We've been spending most of the time this morning sitting, so we'll stand for this word. From Zephaniah chapter 1, hear the word of our God. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs of, to the host of, hev of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord and do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and, and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the, of the mortar, for all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there, a day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. 
Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and be glorified in this time, we pray, for the sake of Jesus, your only Son. Amen. Well, as if the year 2020 couldn't get any worse, here comes Pastor John with a message from the prophet Zephaniah. Uh, we're going to be looking at Zephaniah for Christmas, and at first glance, uh, Zephaniah sort of seems like a Grinch, right? Uh, he, he's, you know, he's somebody who's as cuddly as a cactus, as charming as an eel, and uh, we wouldn't want to get near him with a 39 and a half foot pole. Actually, 39 and a half feet is probably a lot closer than many of us have gotten to the prophet Zephaniah over these past few years, isn't it? Uh, but the truth is, and here's what I want, want you to see this morning, Zephaniah is really the kind of Grinch that we need. Uh, he's the kind of Grinch that we all need. He is a Grinch for such a time as this. How? Uh, well, because we, rem we need to remember that before we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we need to remember the reason that Jesus came. He didn't come so that we could have a day once a year to give each other presents and eat far too many cookies. Right? He came to enter the darkness of this world and to shine in the darkness and to take the darkness upon himself, the darkness of our sins, the darkness of our sorrows, and yes, the sort of darkness that Re Zephaniah speaks about in Zephaniah chapter 1, the darkness of the wrath of God against our sins so that we might be delivered from these terrible things. Uh, and, and that's what we need to remember and reflect upon during the season of Advent as we prepare for, the, yes, what is the joy to the world in the coming of Jesus, right? The, the wonderful news that Jesus, the Savior, has been born among us. We need to remember the reason he came. He was a child born to die for you and me. And so, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's what, we're, what we're looking at through this season of Advent. Zephaniah, the Grinch who gives us Christmas. The Grinch who prepares the way to celebrate the true meaning of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he doesn't mince words, does he, uh, this, this prophet? From the very start, what are the first words of his prophecy? Right after he introduces himself in verse 1, he sa it says in verse 2, what? I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Okay, that's awkward. Nice to meet you, Zephaniah. Uh, you know, is, is this like the crazy uncle that we all want to avoid at Thanksgiving dinner? Uh, th this guy who just introduces himself and all of a sudden I'm going to utterly sweep, and sweep away everything from the face of the earth. There goes crazy Zeph again, uh, talking, rambling on and on about death and judgment over and over like he always does. But actually, if you look at verse 1, you find that Zephaniah was, was actually a pretty important guy, wasn't he? Uh, he was the great, great grandson of who? King Hezekiah, who was a very important king in the history of Israel, one of the great kings of Judah, uh, right? In other words, this guy who is speaking these words of prophecy has royal blood in his veins, and he prophesied at a very significant time in the history of Judah as well during the reign of King Josiah. Josiah reigned from 639 to 609 B.C., uh, which was a time during the middle of his reign that was a great religious revival uh, in, in Jerusalem at the, at the measures of King Josiah. And no doubt, it was one of, the, one of the things that spurred this great revival, in addition to finding a copy of the Book of the Law in the temple, was the preaching of this prophet Zephaniah. Uh, the preaching of Zephaniah. And so the central point of Zephaniah's message right from the start, right, is that there is coming this great day of judgment. But you may have noticed as we are reading through chapter 1, there's actually two different themes of judgment intertwined as you go through the message of Zephaniah. There's first the great judgment that is coming upon the whole earth at the last day, but then there's also a very specific judgment that Zephaniah talks about that's coming upon Jerusalem. 
uh, which was very close to Zephaniah's time. It happened in 587 BC when, uh, when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem. And this is actually something that the prophets, not just Zeph Zephaniah, but many of the prophets do frequently. They will intertwine the great, you know, the prophecy of the great day of judgment at the last day with more specific, smaller judgments that were coming closer to the time in which they prophesied. And there's a very good reason that they do this. Uh, actually, probably a few different reasons, but one of the reasons is, I think, because the Lord wants us to see in every, event, every major event in human history, these aren't just things that, got, that take God by surprise. Right? They aren't things that, you know, God isn't not just sitting far off in heaven aloof and, and dis, disengaged and disconnected and, look, and, and just every once in a while glancing down at the world, seeing how we're doing. No, God is actively involved in, in the events of human history. He's actively involved in our world right now. He is actively involved and has a purpose even for the, for, for the things that we have seen in the year 2020. Uh, and, and this is why that you have this intertwining of these more these smaller events of judgment in history and pointing forward to the great day of judgment at the last day. Because really, every cataclysmic event that happens in the world, and don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that right now we're in a time where God is judging one specific sin. But I am saying that all of these things are meant to wake us up to the reality that the day is near. Not only the great last day, but also the day for each one of us is near. Right? We're, we're all going to die. Uh, it's, you can't avoid it. It's going to happen. And, 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 we, and God is gracious to wake us up to that reality. And so, Zephaniah wakes us up. And so there's this movement to Zephaniah that's it's sort of Zephaniah chapter 1 sort of shaped like an hourglass, right? You start off with the broad general judgment and then you narrow down to the more specific judgment and then you broaden out again to the final judgment. First verses 2 and 3 speak about the great judgment on all the earth. Then verses 4 through 13 focus more narrowly on the judgment that is coming within a few decades to the people of Judah. Then verses 14 through 18 broaden out again to the whole world. And so verses 2 and 3, the Lord declares that he is going to sweep away everything, right? And then he specifically mentions what? Man and beast, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. So land, sky, and sea. In other words, every part of the created world will not will go touched by uh, this judgment. And the order that they're listed in here is actually very significant because this is the exact reverse of the order that we find in the days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. This is a reversal of creation. This judgment that Zephaniah is talking about, we might even refer to it as a decreation, a decreation from everything swept away from the last to the first. Why? Uh, sounds pretty extreme, right? Uh, so why is it so severe? You see, here's the thing. We were created in the image of God. What does that mean? We were created to be God's representatives in the world. We were put in this created world to represent the fatherly care, goodness, kindness, justice, mercy of our creator. We, the hu human beings, made in the image of God. Uh, and, and, and so what happens when we sin? What happens is that we twist and we pervert the image of God, the image of our creator. And therefore, as we do that, we also twist and we pervert the creation, which is one reason why the judgment is described as a reversal of the creation, right? Remember way back to Genesis chapter 3, the first sin when God brings judgment and curse upon the world for Adam and Eve's sin. What specifically does Genesis 3 say the curse is upon? Three things, pain and childbearing, thorns and thistles coming from the ground, and death. Right? Those, those three things. Why those three things specifically? Because Genesis 1.28. It's often referred to as the cultural mandate, right? But it's important to see it's not really a mandate. It is a blessing. What does God say in, in Genesis 1.28? It says, God blessed them 
and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion upon everything that is over the face of the earth. That is God's word of blessing upon the man and the woman he created. And then when they sin and they pervert the created order, what happens? God curses the very things that he spoke blessing on at the beginning. Childbearing, right? Uh, working the ground and life filling the earth. These three things. And so what do we have? We have now a world where all of our fruitfulness is mingled with pain and sorrow. We have a world where the very ground that we were originally created to have dominion over now fights against us, right, in all sorts of ways. And we have a world where that same ground that we were taken out of will one day receive every one of us as we are covered in the dust and death. Now, why, why, I'm not just saying this to, to ruin your day. Why, why do I want to say all of these things this morning? Why do we need to, do, do, to know this? Because it's true, well, yes, but also because it's good news. Uh, are you crazy? <laughs> uh, how, how can I say that, that this truth of God's judgment is good news? He, here's what I mean, and hopefully you'll see something of... of of, of what I'm saying here. I know it sounds crazy, but hear me out. Because it is, in reality, the only thing that makes any sense of the world that we actually live in right now. It's the only thing that makes any sense of all of it, right? No, it does not answer all of our questions, but when, I don't know about you, when I look at the evil and the suffering and the darkness of the world around us, there is nothing that is more hopeless to me than the thought that this is all random and meaningless and there's no point to any of it. That, that is, to me, that is truly hopeless, right? I don't know about you, but I simply cannot live in a world like that. I can't live in a world like that. If all of this is just random and meaningless and it's just vain suffering, that is a terrifying, deeply dark thought. The idea that, there's a, that, that God tells us the reason that all of these things happen and also tells us, as he tells us that reason, the cure, the way to be delivered out of it, is good news. Do you see that? Uh, can I get an amen? Is that good news? God gives us in his word the diagnosis. If you're sick and you don't know what's wrong with you, is it good news for somebody to come along and say, I know what's wrong with you. Here's what it is. And guess what? I know what will make you better. Some of you have had experiences like that, haven't you? Uh, that is good news to get the diagnosis. God in his word gives us the diagnosis and then he gives us the cure. Amen? Th that's good news. That is good news. We need that diagnosis. We need that cure. The, the, the news of God's judgment is like major surgery, right? It is not a happy thought. Uh, it, it's, it's deeply painful when you're going through it, but, what, but we need it to be healed. We need the knife of God's judgment to cut into us. Why? So that the healing of his love might fill us and change us. That's what Zephaniah is doing. He's not just trying to make us sad. He's not just trying to scare us. He is trying to heal us. And so, Zephaniah's message from that universal judgment then goes on and gets more specific, doesn't it? As he then gives the diagnosis specifically to the people who are hearing him in his day, the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And he says he, the diagnosis for the people in Judah and Jerusalem are, is, two, is two parts. And I want to suggest to you it's a diagnosis for us here today too. It's a diagnosis for the church in the 21st century. First, judgment is coming for their false worship. For their false worship. Verses 4 through 9. We read about judgment coming upon Judah and Jerusalem, God's chosen place and his chosen people. Why? For their idolatrous worship. The Lord says he will cut off the remnant of Baal, those 
who worship what? The, the Canaanite god of productivity, the god Baal. Uh, but look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Yes, they worship Baal and Milcom, but they also, it says, bow down and swear by the name of the Lord. So this isn't a matter of people who don't worship the Lord. What are they doing? They are worshiping the Lord just as one among many other gods. And I want to suggest to you that we have that going on in our day all over the place. We do that ourselves, do we not? Uh, how do we see it happening in our day? Here's one uh, commentator of Zeph from Zephaniah. I read this earlier this week, and I thought these words are really prescient. Uh, a couple decades ago, a guy named J. Alec Motyer wrote this, wherever people see bank balances, prosperity, a sound economy, and productivity as their security, Baal is still worshipped. Whenever excitement in religion becomes an end in itself, whenever the cult of what helps replaces joy in what's true, Baal is still worshipped. Does that speak to any of us this morning? Uh, Baal is still worshipped, friends. Uh, these, are, these are prescient words. Why? Because in our day, what do we see happening? In our day, we see these false securities, economy, uh, productivity, prosperity, uh, what helps. All of these false securities that we have, we see them being swept away, don't we? And God is saying, what? Turn to me. Those things are not your security. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Psalm 46, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be thrust into the heart of the sea, God is with us. God is with us. Amen? That's what, that's, God is waking us up to these things, which leads us then to the second specific thing, that Zephaniah highlights for us, which is judgment for our false trusts. Note well verse 12. Look at verse 12. Talks about what? The, those who are complacent. Um, at that time, he says, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good nor will he do ill. This is what some have referred to as practical atheism, right? This whole notion that, yeah, we, we acknowledge intellectually the idea that God exists, but we live our lives in such a way as to say he, he's not there and he doesn't care, right? The Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Uh, whenever we say in our hearts these things, we are acting like those who are complacent, right? In other, in other words, the complacent believe within what? That God is complacent. To be complacent is to believe that God is complacent. The Lord will not do good, neither will he do ill, right? We, we, we want to think that God is just like us. Like, you know, he's sitting up in heaven on his couch, you know, just saying, eh, whatever, you know, do whatever you want. Glance down every once in a while and see what's going on. No, and see, this again, this is where I really believe that Zephaniah has a very specific word for our world today. You see, what is the point of the year 2020? What, what, what's the point of all of these things? Is this all just a bunch of random, meaningless stuff that has no purpose? No. The point is this. God is not complacent. He's not complacent, right? The whole history of the world is this ongoing up and down of just like a constant turbulence, right? An up and down between these seasons of relative safety and prosperity and health and security, followed by these long stretches of just chaotic turmoil and war and sickness and poverty and all of these things. And today... We are in a season of turbulence, are we not? Uh, so much turbulence that it feels like the plane is going to go down. Actually, the, the oxygen masks have dropped down from the, ce from the ceiling of the plane, and we're all wearing them right now, right? That's what it feels like. The plane is going down. Where is it all going to lead? And people are asking, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? And you see, that's how we are, right? In times of safety and security, what do we do? We ignore him. <laughs> then when calamity comes, we want to accuse him of wrongdoing. 
Uh, and God is saying no. Right? I would, you know, as Angel reminded us last week, where is God in the year 2020? Well, the same place he was in the year 2019, sitting on his throne. The Lord is in the heavens. He does whatever, his, whatever he pleases. This is a dark and distressing time. We don't know where it's going to lead. It, 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 is, it is difficult. It is hard. Uh, and and, and if, if the truth of, of God's word wasn't there to guide us through it, then if you're like me, you would just simply despair. And you would curl up in a ball in your room. But thanks be to God, he tells us, I'm not complacent. I'm there. I'm present. I sent Jesus to die for you. And, and, and if I sent Jesus to die for you, then I am most certainly with you in the darkness, in the struggle, in the pain, in the hardship. Our God is not far off and aloof. Amen. He is with us in the darkest of times. And so, what is God doing on all, in all of this? Again, he is shaking us up so that we might turn to him and be healed of what it is that truly ails us. Not COVID. COVID is just a symptom of the much larger problem. But the sickness of soul that has brought all suffering and death into our world, because the fact of the matter is this. No matter what happens with COVID, if it, if it disappears next month, if there's a, a vaccine that's coming that is 100% effective, and let us pray that that happens. Yes, it's right to pray that that happens. It's right to desire that. It's right to seek that, yes. But even if that happens, it will not change the fact that we're still going to die. It's not going to change the reality. That will be a, a treatment of the symptom, but it will not heal the fundamental problem, which is sin and death in the world. And we do know this. God's calling always for us and for the world around us is what? Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel that we may be eternally and truly healed. And so how does that happen? Well, Zephaniah 1 closes in such a way that you might think it's hopeless. But in reality, I want to suggest to you that Zephaniah 1, as it closes, points us directly to the way that we are healed. Listen to this, verses 14 through 16. I'll read it once again. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of, that, of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry. Again, note an echo of the creation with this sevenfold repetition of the Hebrew word yom, the word day, seven times in verses 15 and 16. In the beginning... God spoke into the world that was covered in darkness and said, let there be light. And that was the first of the days of creation, those days when God brought life and light and spread throughout the world. And now of this day, it is said, what? A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Again, this theme of the reversal of the creation. Indeed, the day, Zephaniah said, over 2,500 years ago, go is near. How is that? From our perspective, it is so near that in one sense we might even say that it has already come even as we wait the day when it is yet to come. How has it already come? There's a hint back in verses 7 and 8 where Zephaniah calls this great day of judgment what? The day of the Lord's sacrifice the day of the Lord's sacrifice. And that day of the Lord's sacrifice, truly, dear friends, has come. How so? Verse 14 calls it the bitter day when the mighty man will cry aloud, Beloved, there was a day of the Lord's sacrifice from Zephaniah's perspective 600 years in the future. Now from my, our perspective, 2,000 years in the past, 
when the mightiest man who ever lived cried aloud at the judgment of God. And what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not them, not the ones who deserve this judgment, me, innocent, spotless, perfect, beautiful, glorious, eternal, majestic Son of God, the Word of God the Father in our very flesh, cursed, distressed, taking on the darkness of the wrath of God, death itself, thrust into the darkness of the grave for you and for me. Why? So that this judgment that Zephaniah prophesied about, which is coming upon all who don't trust in Christ and believe the gospel, might be reversed for those who trust in Jesus. Amen? Glorious truths. We need to see that in order to see the reason for the decorations up here right now. We need to see that in order for the light to have any meaning. This candle representing to us the light of Jesus Christ that shines in the darkness. And not only that, that took the darkness upon himself back in the first century, but the light that is with you and me right now. The Lord has a day. That day when Jesus died on the cross was a day when this great last time judgment, wrath of God was poured out on the perfect Son of God so that we might be released from it. And, and if we face it alone, if we are not covered with that shelter of the cross, Verse 18 says what? Neither their silver nor their gold will be able, able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. The best that we have, the best of our riches, the best of our efforts, the best of our technology, the best of our health care, the best of our politics, the best of our science and our business and our good works, None of it can rescue us on that day. But <laughs> the hope of the gospel is this. There is something far more precious than silver or gold, far more precious than any created thing, and that is the blood of Jesus. Listen to this, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. The apostle Peter tells us, you were ransomed from the futile ways of your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, not with those sorts of things that Zephaniah says in verse 18, cannot deliver you, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. That's the good news. That's the gospel. How then shall we live? How then shall we live in such a time as this? In such a time as we find ourselves right now with the distress and darkness all around us. We need to remember amidst the intense turbulence of this present age, amidst the intense turbulence of this time in which, in which we live, we need to remember, beloved, that there is one thing that is far worse than being in the turbulence. And what is that? It's being stuck in the airport <laughs> indefinitely with a canceled flight. Seriously, imagine you're at the airport, and I'll close with this illustration. Uh, your, fight, your flight's been delayed, right, several hours. And uh, at first you're upset about it, but then as time passes, what happens? You start to get distracted by all the surroundings in the airport, uh, and, and, and you forget. What? That you're waiting for the plane to take off. You're supposed to be going somewhere. Why? Because, well, you know, there are places to shop in the airport and the food can be pretty decent. And so you forget that you're supposed to be going somewhere. And, you're, and when the time comes that it's announced that your plane is boarding, you stay in the airport. You don't get on the plane. Uh, and you see, that's something like what we are like when we forget the story of Advent when we forget this truth that we are going somewhere, that we have not yet arrived, uh, even as we prepare 
to celebrate the first coming of Jesus, we eagerly anticipate the truth, the reality of his second coming. We need to keep our eyes fixed on the end, end goal, lest we get distracted and we not remember that we are going somewhere. Because, dear friends, once again, the day is coming and it is not far off for any one of us when we will stop journeying and we will die. And when that day comes, Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed unto man to die once, and after that comes judgment. But then, like a, like, a, like a bursting ray of light that fills the room, what does the author of Hebrews say right after that? Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Are you waiting? Let us wait. Let's wait together and encourage each other in the journey. The Lord has appointed a day for the world. He has also appointed a day for every one of us. Let us repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Help us. We need eyes to see. We need, Lord, you to wake us up from our complacency. I need you to wake me up of my complacency. Thank you that amidst the darkness you still speak to us. You draw us to yourself. And that as long as we remain, there is a good God who is with us. And there is room for us at the table. And you call us with arms open to receive us, to turn again and again to you. So, Lord, have mercy upon every one of us. May we live in this, really, in my lifetime, what is the darkest Christmas season that we've ever experienced in, in, in our society, in my lifetime at least. Be with us to hold out to the world around us the light of Jesus, the true and eternal light, the hope of the world, without which we have no hope. We pray these things in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.